many of them, in fact, in their original context, are addressing either Jews as a group or a specific group of Jews or specific individual Jews. Some are talking about mankind in general. Some are talking about Gentiles, but many are speaking about Jews themselves. And that's terribly important because Paul's point is all people, Jews and Gentiles, are under sin. And thus, verse 19 drives home the point of this string of quotes. Look what Paul says in verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, law here is used in a broad general sense, not just for the Torah, Genesis through Deuteronomy, but for the Old Testament scriptures in total, because all these quotes come from the Psalms, except for one that comes from Isaiah. So the Old Testament scripture. So now we know that whatever the law, i.e. the Old Testament scripture says, it speaks to those who are under the law. Who's that? Jews and all who have converted to Judaism. And so whatever the law says, whatever the Old Testament scriptures say, they say it to those whose scriptures they are, who listen to those scriptures, who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable before God. Let's uh, explore that just a little bit. When he says, so that every mouth may be closed, the idea is they have nothing to say in their defense. The scriptures have spoken so clearly and so definitively that they have nothing to say in their own defense. What can you say? God has charged that all people are sinners. All people have done wrong. There's no fear of God before their eyes. There's no one who's legitimately righteous. Everyone is guilty, right? So every mouth may be closed, nothing to say in their defense, and all the world the whole world, all the people in the world, Jews as well as Gentiles, all mankind may become, in this translation, accountable to God. That particular word for accountable is hupadikos in Greek, and Ben Witherington in his commentary on Romans points out that the normal meaning of the word in secular Greek is guilt or guilty, far more than just accountable or accountability. So the idea of the word really is guilty. In other words, that the whole world may be guilty before God um, in the sense of legal guilt, not feelings of guilt. Whether you feel guilt or not doesn't really matter if you are objectively guilty by the standard of God's righteous law. That's the point. That's the case Paul has been building, that the whole world stands before God guilty as charged. Now, in verse 20, then, he says, continuing the thought that he began, that the law really closes every mouth, makes them all guilty, because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in God's sight. This is, this is a quote from Psalm 143, verse 2, that emphasizes this idea. No flesh, no person, no human being will be justified in God's sight. What does the word justified mean? It's going to be a very important word in our next section because Paul now is going to go to solution beginning in verse 21 and tell us how somebody does get justified. So what does it mean to be justified? Well, we'll explain it more in detail in the next session. But essentially, what justified means is put into a right relationship with God, declared in the right. It also includes the idea of thus being a part of the people of God. Those that are justified are also part of God's covenant. They're in good standing with the covenant. They are right with God and in a right relationship with God. More details on that in the upcoming session. But here, know that, that no flesh is going to be put into a right relationship with God by virtue of the law, the Old Testament law. He says, because by the works of the law, meaning observing the Torah, keeping the old covenant, that didn't work. Didn't work for the Jews, not going to work for anyone else. In fact, the Jews suffered the curses of that covenant. They are still enduring the, the long-standing curse of exile under foreign domination. God's glory is not returned to his people, right? So they're still experiencing the ultimate and final curse of that covenant. And so the, the works of the law, especially the observable kind of boundary marker works, Sabbath keeping, food laws, circumcision, those sorts of things, 
None of those are going to justify somebody in God's sight. Instead, what the law does, Paul says in the last bit of verse 20 is, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. So rather than justifying people, what what the ultimately what the law ended up doing was n- naming sin as sin, creating clear, definitive boundary lines, right? And then what happened was people crossed those boundaries and gained deep knowledge of sin, deep knowledge of their own sin, deep knowledge of their wrongdoing. Here's what the law says, and we didn't keep it. Man, Paul is going to go into massive amounts of details on this later in Romans chapter 7. Uh, but that's really important, that what the law actually did was enunciated and named sin and brought a deeper, greater understanding of and experiential, experiential knowledge of sin itself. So rather than bringing justification, the law brought knowledge of sin. And with that, Paul concludes his case against mankind. They, there they stand before the just judge of the universe, God himself, And what can they say in their own defense? God's word is clear. Their experience is clear. They have all done wrong. Everybody is guilty to some degree or another. No one, therefore, is going to be justified by keeping the Torah, keeping the old covenant. God needed to bring in saving justice. He needed to bring in justification another way, which is the launching pad for this whole section, beginning in 118 through 320. And thus, God is going to bring the gospel in, which will display his righteousness, his saving justice to the whole world for all people, Jews and Gentiles. And so at this point, The the case is closed. The case is settled. Mankind is guilty as charged before God. And as we wrap up this long section that began in chapter 1, let me just point out just maybe a little reflection here that in chapter 1, God hands mankind over to their choices and says, you want evil? You like wickedness? Well, here you go. And he hands them over. Uh, In chapter 2, Paul points out that God's an impartial judge. And thus, God's going to judge all people according to what they have done. He's going to hold all people accountable for what they legitimately have not done. Not just their heritage, not just their their religiosity, not just even their knowledge of his word. What have they really done? And the net effect of that is, well, all people are sinners. All people have done what's wrong. And thus, we really are responsible for our choices. We really are responsible for our character and our behavior. And we really all are therefore culpable. We, we stand before God culpable for our choices. And there is thus a reckoning for each person and each person's behavior. And we all stand before God without anything to say in our defense. We are guilty. Guilty as charged. What's the solution? Well, that's where Paul turns next. <laughs>